Anxiety knows no age limit, but the way adults and children show it differs. A new documentary series based here in Kansas City wants us to pay better attention. We meet the man behind this mission and hear his remarkable story just ahead. Good morning. It is Monday, August 29th. I'm Jessica Lovell. Welcome into the Morning Medical Update. We are live here inside the Dolph C. Simons Jr. Family Broadcast Studio. COVID and monkeypox cases are still with us, of course. We're going to see how we did over the weekend. Check in with Doc Hawk. Last week, the FDA approved a new drug to treat major depressive disorder. The first of its kind in 60 years. So we have a lot to talk about today. Our experts include the founder of the Freedom Project, Abraham Cisse. Also, we have Dr. Tyler Chervastad. He is the Director of Comprehensive Depression Assessment and Treatment Clinic here at the Health System. And we have child psychologist, Dr. Tyler Dreji. They are ready to answer your questions, so please get them sent in to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You can find links to those right there on your screen. A question for all of us this is, oh, yikes, okay, it's Monday. A question for all of us this morning. Does mental illness prevent us from living or is it proof that we're alive? That's the focus of a brand new documentary series based here in Kansas City. When you're a child and you're going through trauma, you have no value. Trauma, especially for a kid, is a lifelong sentence unless you deal with it. It is called Freedom Project. The goal, rethink mental illness and get people the support they need. The University of Kansas Health System is one of the sponsors for the premiere of this documentary at the Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts. Abraham, good morning. You are a former professional soccer player who founded this project out of your own personal experience with anxiety that was brought on after being uprooted from your home and your family living in Africa. So you speak openly about the isolation that you suffered and trusting the wrong people. You call the Freedom Project a mental health startup. What do you hope to accomplish through this? Yeah, um, um, first of all, thank you for having me. You know, it's an honor to be here and, you know, speaking to, you know, you guys and your audience as well. Um, and again, thanks, you know, thank you so much to KU uh, for the University of Kansas Health System for like jumping on board as a, you know, like one of the sponsors. Uh, but yeah, um, so I, I um, it, it, uh, just a trigger warning, you know, I, I actually lost like one of my best friends back in 2020, you know, due to violence. And uh, um, I just uh, basically made a conscious um, decision that I'm going to do something about it. So the goal now with the Freedom Project is to end violence in general. Uh, so I do the true film and um, also I use technology because that's my background um in order to talk about this problem so as an athlete or a former athlete i use that avenue as a way to reach as many people as possible because sports is one thing that we all really deeply care about and as a former athlete i uh, i mean i used to remember you know people wanting to take pictures with me and that concept always blew my mind so i'm just like what's the best way to tackle violence and also talk about mental health so what is it like how does it feel for you to to watch this all finally come together Wow. Um, yeah, uh, it's been um, six years uh, and, the, you know, I had to go through a very challenging um, like process because I'm also a dad. Um, even this month uh, of August, I had to, you know, find um, people to watch, you know, my, my son and just so that I, I can focus and go on and be able to actually do this. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been very challenging and very humbling at the same time because I, I came in with um, I'm blazing hot saying that I'm going to fix this problem. But but then the more that I learned about the system around mental health and, you know, I had to double down a little bit. That's why it's taking me six years. And, and you know, uh, unfortunately, with COVID, I've lost almost um, four people through this process. So, um, yeah, it's 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 been a very challenging uh, process. But I, I think the fact that I'm aware of therapy, I'm aware of mental illnesses, I'm a where of my own mental illnesses, it's been a very uh, beautiful process at the same time. Yeah, you have a true perspective. So this documentary plans to address core community issues like pediatric and adult mental health, burnout, violence, and homelessness in Kansas City. Yeah. Uh, that, that is a lot to unpack. I wanna bring in Dr. <laughs> Trivastad. Um, where does it begin? What do we need to know about mental health and anxiety among adults? Yeah, so I think, um, 
it's important to distinguish between normal anxiety that every human being is going to experience. And in fact, anxiety can sometimes be a very positive thing. Um, and so I think of anxiety on a bell curve distribution, right? If you have too little anxiety, you're not motivated to do anything. You're not um, engaged. You don't really have that gumption to get up and go. And then on the extreme end, you have too much anxiety. It's crippling. It's too much fear. Um, the classic example in psychiatry is a patient with agoraphobia who never leaves their house because they're so anxious about the world. Um, and so a healthy level of anxiety is something that's totally normal. But whenever it's on one extreme or the other, um, we can kind of pathologize it. And approximately, I think, 20% uh, of, of current Americans have an anxiety disorder of some kind, and 30% um, over the lifetime of a human being will probably develop some kind of anxiety disorder. So it's pretty prevalent, um, and that's kind of like the basic background for it. Right, and, and we use the term anxiety, I think, a lot. Mm -hmm. We throw it around. Um, it does apply to some, but yeah. it, it can be maybe something else for someone else. But you, you did, you kind of explained it. Anxiety can be a good thing, mm -hmm. which, um, like you said, what does it tell us? What What's good about it? And what, yeah. what is it telling us about ourselves and how we're coping with things? Right, so anxiety can be motivating, right? I mean, the thing that you feel anxious about, like, oh, I procrastinated on this, I need to go get it done, it actually can be productive for us. Um, if you don't have that, you're going to be kind of lackadaisical. You may not um, have any anxiety. The classic example here is like depression. You're really unmotivated. You have no drive to do anything. Nothing can light a fire. Um, but that can go too far, right? So you can have way too much anxiety. You can get paralyzed by it. And so it's one of those things that um, healthy in moderation, but you don't want too little or too much of it. Um, and I'd probably just leave it there. <laughs> All right, Dr. Drake, more and more kids, as we know, suffering from mental health issues. So what does anxiety look like in children? How does it differ from what we see in adults? Sure. Or does it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we're seeing an increase in anxiety with our, our children and adolescents um, throughout the pandemic, and it's continued to increase. It, it looks similar in some ways to adult anxiety, and that's, you know, your fear, your worry, um, some things that we kind of classically think with anxiety. Um, how we see the difference in children is we often see difficulties with concentration, an increase in activity level. Teachers are reporting, well, they were doing really well, and now they're not focusing. Now they're bouncing off the walls in classrooms, things like that. We also see difficulties with sleep, um, irritability, anger, mood swings, these, these aggressive, some types of aggressions at times, um, as well as, um, you know, just asking for reassurance, asking the same question to teachers, to parents, um, trying to seek that reassurance to decrease that anxiety. Abraham, so the first episode is all about sports and mental health. We've been talking a lot about sports as kids head back to the classroom and back to the fields and the courts. You spoke with some local professional athletes. Um, for yeah. all of the parents of athletes out there watching, what, what is your takeaway as an athlete yourself on prioritizing you know, mental health even before the sport? Yeah, um, so um, even as a former athlete, um, one of the biggest things that I feel like parents always miss is that the child actually has a voice and they actually want to communicate. And this is one thing, uh, something that, you know, unfortunately my, my own parents um, actually miss, uh, the fact that I didn't even want to play soccer. But, you know, I happened to be good at it and um, I was pressured to play, but I didn't really know how to communicate because that space wasn't created for me to even have a voice because um, I came from an African family. So you, you, you can either be a doctor or you'd be uh, a failure. So <laughs> but so um, um, but with me, I was also dealing with a lot of trauma at the same time, you know, from having a stutter as a little kid and then going through something very traumatic. Uh, and I didn't have a space to, talk, to basically have this conversation with my parents, because again, the space wasn't created and soccer became a, such a big, um, um, like a difficult thing for me to keep like doing, but I had to, because my parents wanted me to basically do it. So again, just having that conversation with our kids and making sure that we like create that space, because even me now, I try to create that with my four-year-old, uh, which is also becoming such an interesting thing because he's so aware. Uh, maybe I'm just saying that, uh, but, uh, but but he knows uh, so much and he has so much to like share, which is sometimes overwhelming. But, you know, it's a good thing that I'm creating that because I didn't have that. Well, yeah, kids know a lot, don't they? A absolutely. lot more than you think. Right. Just a little four or five year old. They, they know a lot more than we think. Right, Doc? Yeah, absolutely. Amen. They're <laughs> they're, cu they're cued into their their feelings, their emotions. Um, they they show us signs that they're they're feeling this way. And so, like Abraham was saying, it's really important to open that space to to be able to allow them to express their thoughts and their feelings and, and hear that. Yeah, so. be looking for it. Like you said, open your eyes. OK, Jordan has a question, Abraham. I'm going to give this to you. I struggle with mental health. I've struggled with it for years. How will the Freedom Project work to change the stigma around mental health. That is a big, that's a big right. mountain to climb. 
how, how is this going to help? Yeah, so I actually love this question a lot because um, when I initially decided to go see a psychologist, I, I went because um, an ex-girlfriend kept telling me that I needed help. And uh, luckily, I had that motivation to go and see a psychologist. Uh, but the process of trying to find a psychologist, I didn't even know what was the difference between a therapist, a psychologist, a counselor. So I was going to Google typing therapist and I would see a psychologist. And I was like, no, I need a therapist because my girlfriend says so. <laughs> but um, um, so what I'm creating right now is to use video in order to help people understand what mental illnesses are all about. How do you find all this basic information that, in my opinion, I feel like usually the experts will miss uh, because these are the basic things that are adding to stigma or when it comes to the intake process usually you have to talk to almost three different psychologists before you even see the actual psychologist that that's going to see you so imagine you talking to the same person i mean three different people and, and being vulnerable sometimes it can be very heavy for someone who already has this stigma to even talk about it and then also another part where i'm using technology or uh, um to to basically create uh which my my really good friend cody uh cody isabel was able to explain which is creating um you know, x-ray for the mind, because when you break your ha your hand and you go to every doctor, they will say you, you, your hand's broken. But when it comes to mental illness, you can go to different uh, uh, um, psychologists or counselors and you are being told you have different things, which maybe I'm not really educated on this aspect, but I want to basically simplify it so that we can eliminate stigma and then using film to basically have, you know, those difficult uh, conversation around you know what mental illnesses are like and when it comes to parents as well letting the kids have have a voice as well dr trivastad i want to ask you because access to mental health is it, it's a problem for people and just some of the things that abraham just said it just like you said you google search something and you you're you just there's so much to sift through so how do we know where to go for help um what kind of help we need help us understand how to how to navigate through all that yeah, so I th that's a multimodal question. So depending on the problem you're dealing with, it's one of those things that um, will kind of dictate the response. So, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling, you know, a little bit sad or a little bit depressed, um, that might be where you seek out just an office visit with a psychologist or a psychiatrist um, to see them in the office. If you're feeling more depressed or suicidal or thinking about taking your own life or having extreme distress to where you can't eat, you can't drink, that's probably where you want to come into the hospital and kind of seek out resources there. Um, and so really the severity of your symptoms, and sometimes that's not best assessed by you. Sometimes you want to ask the people around you or people that are close to you to say, how do you think I'm doing? How do you think I'm functioning? And um, if they think that you've really you know, kind of dropped off this metaphorical cliff and um, you're, you're not functioning at the level you were and it's, it's that severe, you probably want to escalate that to a higher level of care like an emergency room or an urgent care for more thorough and efficient evaluation. Well, and it's tough because what Abraham was saying, my ex-girlfriend told me I needed help. Mm -hmm. It's not he's easy to hear those words. I right. think you need help. Mm -hmm. um, so that's tough to do. But, um, but like you said, ask the people around you that right. truly care about mm -hmm. you and love you. Um, so. Doctor, I have a question for you. Cindy asked, how do you know if your kid is just sad or suffering from true depression that needs a, a, an extra level of help? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. You know, I think that we all have times where we feel sad and we feel down. It's when these prolonged periods of sadness, of irritability, a change in the way the child is interacting, um, lack of interest in things they used to previously really enjoy um, engaging in. Um, so it's these periods of time where where you're starting to see a different kid for weeks and that sort of thing. And if you have questions, talk with the school counselor, the teacher, see if they're seeing similar difficulties in the classroom. Talk with your pediatrician. Um, if you have any concerns at all, ask professional help and, um, and we can, can help assess and, and treat. Dr. Trevistad, what is the true definition of anxiety? You talked a little bit about it, but um, what should we be specifically looking for? And is there an actual definition that might distinguish it from all the other types of things? Yeah, so unfortunately there's not. Anxiety is a symptom, um, and so we have specified diseases um, that kind of run the range of anxiety. So we have generalized anxiety, that's kind of an excessive worry about multiple things. Um, and again, it impairs your functioning, right? So you can have normal worries that don't impair your functioning and you don't have a psychiatric condition. Um, so we have generalized anxiety. I talked about agoraphobia 
agoraphobia earlier, that is literally a fear of pretty much everything in the world. So um, you don't leave your house, you're not engaging with people. Very extreme. Uh, yep, extreme okay. anxiety. And then you have other anxiety conditions in there. So trauma is one of those anxiety conditions that we've talked about a little bit this morning. OCD is technically um, an anxiety disorder also. Um, and so we have this kind of wide ranging definition of, of the symptoms of anxiety and then they can fit into different boxes. Um, but really it all comes down to functional impairment. So there's some other you know, associated findings that go along with each anxiety dis disorder, but it really comes down to anxiety about something and then functional impairment, and then we can try to you know, piece together what the other unifying diagnosis is from the other symptoms. But you can have anxiety and still be functioning, yes. correct? Yeah. And yeah. Okay, so are you seeing an increase in anxiety in our kids, our young people, and do we know why? Yeah, I think that there's definitely been an increase in anxiety with, with our children and adolescents. Um, we've seen an increase since the, the pandemic. Um, you know, I think one of the, the positives of the pandemic is, is that it destigmatized mental health. So it's, it's okay to not be okay. And, um, and parents are hearing that, children are hearing that, they're reaching out. Um, there's also just, this is a, a, can be a trying time. There's a lot of anxiety for adults. There's a lot of anxiety for, for children. And so um, we are definitely seeing that. When, when the pandemic started, I saw that when, when we went to um, virtual learning, the social anxiety kiddos that I worked with, they actually really improved, um, which makes sense because they're not having to go and, and face this. So more of these avoidant, they, their avoidance gets, is able to, to, to occur. Um, then school starts back in person and the anxiety shoots back up. So we definitely are seeing this, this trend. All right, I wanna hang tight on this conversation. Let's get to Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control, joining us on this Monday with our numbers. How'd we do over the weekend? You know, we're still doing pretty good. I'd like, I'd like to say about the anxiety, you know, certainly as we heard when it started, the pandemic started, anxiety started, but also opening back up and going back out into crowds, I think has induced some anxiety with sure. people as well. Um, so that, that's another active issue also. Right now, as far as uh, infections in the health system, 27 active infections, one in the ICU, three on the ventilator, still 20 in that recovery period. But again, Jessica, you know, overall reported cases and hospitalizations are on the downtrend. So hopefully we will get down into under 20 and under 10 into those single digit hospitalizations uh, fairly soon. Yeah, we like to hear that good yeah. news. How are we doing with monkeypox? What do we know about you know, those monkey cases? Monkeypox continues, the cases continue to increase, although not at the same rate that they were the previous three or four, uh, five weeks. And we know that we are continuing to give out vaccine. I think we've given just about 100 doses or so of the vaccine since we opened it up. So hopefully we'll continue to get more of those uh, vaccine doses into people's arms. All right, I have some questions for you today. Yeah. Just and let's stay on monkeypox for a moment. Multiple monkeypox vaccines and antiviral trials are being launched across yeah. and around the world. Explain how this works and, and why they're so important right now. Yeah, they're so important right now because we really don't have any data about uh, the current vaccines or the antiviral tecoviramat or TPOX. Uh, specifically in humans. We know that that antiviral is safe from safety studies in humans, but as far as doing the actual uh, analysis and trials uh, for monkeypox disease and that antiviral, we are getting that. So we are going to be getting a lot of safety and efficacy data from that. I think that's good, uh, but also even more safety and efficacy data for the vaccine as well. So all this is going to help with our understanding of the disease, but also the preventive measures and the therapeutic measures that we take against this disease as well. Okay, there's an article um, that comes from one of your favorite publications called Nature. Yeah. Uh, could tiny blood clots cause long COVID's puzzling? We've been trying mm -hmm. to figure this out for a long time, this mm -hmm. long COVID, all, all these symptoms that are being caused. Why would blood clots be to blame and, and how would we fix that? Yeah, I mean, certainly for things like uh, brain fog, you know, the blood clots, they will reduce the amount of oxygen. This is, you know, one of the simple mechanisms would be reducing the amount of oxygen to your brain tissues. Um, those very, very small blood clots, we know that does affect other organs as well. And we are really looking at the reasons for the long COVID symptoms for all of those symptoms. Uh, some of them may have the same uh, mechanism, some may not. The blood clots, we've certainly know that has been an issue early on as far as looking at large blood clots, say in the lungs and in your, in your leg uh, vessels, but also now up in those smaller vessels up in the brain. So this is one more uh, thing that we can look to try and then treat 
uh, should it continue to be an issue moving forward. And I think we all fully expect long COVID to affect people uh, on a daily basis for quite some time. Okay, according to quote wizard, nearly 30% mm -hmm. of potential college students in Kansas decided to not even go to college because of COVID-19 and nearly 50% of students in Montana, Tennessee, and in eight other states. So what steps are being taken to make sure that campuses mm -hmm. stay safe for everyone this coming year? Yeah, you know, we know that the CDC has put out new guidance for keeping those people safe. Uh, what it does boil down to is your local community, uh, say your county or your city, guidance on what are the rules or what are the restrictions on anything such as indoor masking or uh, uh, um, the amount of people in a certain area, but also it continues to go back to you as an individual, understanding your risks, understanding the important things about those pharmaceutical interventions like vaccine and being up to date, but also those non-pharmaceutical interventions, understanding what situation are you going to be in? Are you gonna wear a mask? It's certainly always okay for you to wear a mask even though others around you are not, but also try to do those other things, understanding the uh, the space that you're in, are you in a large space, is it outdoors, is there good ventilation um, and distance between other people. So, um, you know, college campuses, I think as a whole, have done very good for identifying uh, risks. Uh, we know that those younger age groups are at less risk of severe disease and hospitalization, but still are at risk, and it continues to boil down to you as an individual. All right, Doc Hawk, stick around. All We've right. got some questions coming in for you today. Is anxiety genetic? Researchers say anxiety disorders are more likely to be passed down from fathers to sons and mothers to daughters. A study published in JAMA found children tend to pick up traits and model behavior after the parent of the same biological sex. The CDC found nearly 6 million children between 3 and 17 years old were diagnosed with anxiety between 2016 and 2019, just three years. So um, Dr. Tyler uh, Chervistad, is, um, is this a reminder to all of us that um, kids are kind of watching everything we as adults do? Are we modeling behavior for them? Yeah, I think that is a good reminder. It's also a good reminder that anxiety, as you said, is genetic, and it also seems to have a um, sex prevalence. So females more than males tend to have anxiety disorders by about a 10% margin. Um, and so, um, yeah, we're modeling behavior. We're passing it down in our genes. And so all of those are uh, good reminders and good so things to think about. how do we break those habits? Any well, suggestions? Give us some yeah, tips. Yeah, I was going to say, as far as uh, habits, I think that's where therapy is extremely helpful, right? So cognitive behavioral therapy is all about um, how your anxious thoughts may be making you behave in an anxious manner. Mm -hmm. And so that'll help you kind of become aware of those, change those patterns of behavior. Um, but some of this is genetic, right? And so some of this is not modifiable. And so um, that's where medications can sometimes be um, helpful if we're trying to overcome some kind of genetic issue that may be causing chemical imbalances or other things. But therapy, as far as modifying behavior, is, is the best way. All right, Tyler, uh, Dre, did you Draggy, right? I got it. Okay. Yeah. So how often do you see evidence of kids feeding off parents when working with children suffering from anxiety? We always talk about uh, you know, kids absorbing their, their parents' anxiety and taking that on. Is, is that true? Sure. Absolutely. Um, you know, as a parent, it's, it's distressing to see our child in suffering, feeling anxious. And so for a parent that has anxiety themselves, this becomes even more of a problem. Um, in therapy, what we're seeing with parents, how they pass this down or their anxiety kind of feeds their child is um, avoiding things that might make their child um, anxious. So not going out, not having them go to a birthday party because of the anxiety that creates. Also over controlling their environment, checking and making sure everything's okay every minute of the day. Um, also responding negatively due to our own anxiety to the child's anxiety um, and minimizing those, those experiences and feelings. In therapy, what we do is we help with um, stress tolerance of the parent. And so how to identify when this could be a stressful situation for the child and for you as a parent, and how do we deal with that? You know, the goal is not to eliminate anxiety, the goal is to manage our anxiety and, and teach that to our children as well. Okay, so here's my asking for a friend moment. <laughs> so are there any things that we should avoid doing in front of our kids or conversations or things or buzzwords? I mean, you, when you live in a house with somebody, it's hard to shield them from everything. You know, if something's going on with mom mm -hmm. or work or something's going on, but how do you, is, is there anything that you can give us as far as what we should or should not do around our kids that might help keep their anxiety down and keep yeah. yourselves? Yeah, and, and I think parents are the experts of their children. So, so 
one thing that might work for one family may not work for another. Some families are more open book in what they mm -hmm. discuss and talk about, which helps the child's anxiety and their emotional functioning. And other families, they need to kind of have this more of an adult conversation. You know, the most important thing that parents can do is is talk about their thoughts and their feelings. You know, times where they felt anxious and how they've managed that. You know, this situation came up. This is how I handled it. This may be the way I wish I would have handled it. So, so children are hearing it's okay to talk about thoughts and feelings and experience anxiety, but also ways that, that we can manage it. And we might not get it right the first time, but, but we can keep trying. Just kids and mental health, it's just such an important conversation. And I think everyone's all ears when folks like you are sitting at this desk because anything we can take away to help our kids out, especially right now, is, is it's big, it's big. So Abraham, I wanna ask you, you have several episodes lined up. One of those is childhood trauma and mental health. Talk, uh, uh, talk to us a little bit about your theme for that particular episode and, and kind of what you're finding out so far. Yeah, so um, basically as a former kid, um, I, I um, have um, always wished that, you know, I had the space to have that conversation with my parents. And, you know, and, and I like to take things back to the basic, which is, uh, let's create space so that adults and kids can can basically collaborate effectively. And that could look like, you know, just having this conversation and letting your kid have a voice. Uh, and the reason why I'm even doing this episode, um, um, uh, I guess one of the biggest reasons is because I became a dad and I started seeing some signs of my, my, my own son and the way that he was behaving. Uh, but luckily, I was going to therapy, so I was able to have that conversation with him. Even though he's four, he, he can barely say anything. Uh, but, you know, he sh says so much with the way that he acts, the way that he um, sometimes even yells. So, and these are little things that I'm picking up, so I'm learning from him um, as well. So it's not a waste of time giving your child a voice because they say so much, but they don't say uh, too much at the same time. Yeah, lots to sort through with our kids, trying to read their minds and kind of let them right. expand. Um, but it does, it changes your perspective when you become a parent. Um, I wanna talk about a couple of medicines to treat mental health disorders. The FDA just approved the first and only rapid acting oral medication for the treatment of major depressive disorder or MDD. The time release pill is the first medication approved to treat MDD in over 60 years. And it could hit shelves by the end of this year. Uh, it is not approved for children, though. There is another FDA therapy approved for treatment-resistant depression. It's called um, ketamine. Is that, am I saying that correctly? Ketamine? Nasal ketamine. Spray? Ketamine. Ketamine nasal spray <laughs> therapy. The University of Kansas Health System is one of only a few hospitals in Kansas and in the Kansas City area that offers this therapy. So Dr. Chirvastad, uh, you're the leading psychiatrist for this new outpatient therapy. Um, explain why the nasal spray is limited and where you can get it. And, and what do we know about the benefits of the pill? Mm -hmm. So um, with the uh, S-ketamine or Spravato is the brand name of it, um, it is um, limited because it has uh, some monitoring requirements. So it is a, a procedural um, intervention that's done in our outpatient clinic, but it requires two hours of monitoring for blood pressure because the uh, medication does affect your blood pressure. And so we wouldn't want to give it to you at home and then have you have you know elevated blood pressures or, or worse, some, some complicating side effect from it. Um, it's only approved for treatment-resistant depression also, so it's a kind of a subset of a population, um, but that's why it's kind of restricted in its use is just because of some of the more serious side effects that can come from it as opposed to some oral medications. So compare and contrast that to drugs like Prozac, Paxil, mm -hmm. Zoloft, the ones that we hear about. Yeah, so Zoloft, uh, you know, all Prozac, Paxil, all of those are serotonin modulating agents. Um, ketamine um, and this newer agent that we're actually talking about, Avility or Dextromethorphan, Bupropion, actually work on different receptors in the brain. So they don't actually work on serotonin at all. They work on um, anti-NMDA receptors, which is is a completely different pathway for depression. Um, and so they're kind of novel targets for treating depression because, as we know, um, about 30% of all patients with um, depression will not respond to standard of therapy, whether it's Zoloft or Prozac or Paxil. So I know a lot of people going on anxiety medication Mm -hmm. you know, for the first time in some cases. So how do they know what's right for them? What questions should they be asking their doctor? Or is it really more doctor asking them the questions and making that decision? And if it's not working for you, is it okay to swap and go and 
to a different direction and try something else. Yes. Um, with anxiety, I usually recommend a multimodal approach. Same thing with depression. So you want to combine a little bit of medication, a little bit of psychotherapy, and then if you can change your lifestyle a little bit, improve your sleep, um, maybe change your diet, exercise more. Those are it's kind of a holistic approach to, yeah. to mental health. Not with, a magic pill. It, that's exactly right. So everybody comes in and they always want a single pill to fix you know the depression or their anxiety when usually those are symptoms of something much larger. You let me know when you got one of those. Okay, <laughs> exactly. that would be great, uh, Dr. Drage, um So let's talk about this with kids. A newer drug not available for children right now. So what? Can we offer children, and, and when is the best time to put a child on some type of medication for help? Yeah, so as a psychologist, um, what we see, what we implement for anxiety is an evidence-based approach. Often cognitive behavioral therapy is the gold standard for, for anxiety disorders. Um, so what that is, is we're teaching kids what are their stressors, how to know how their body is telling them that they're starting to feel anxious. Um, what are their thoughts that are getting in the way? What are these negative and in, um, intrusive thoughts that they're experiencing? And then coming up with coping strategies that we can implement and uh, put in place in the real world so that they can practice deep decreasing that anxiety. We also, um, for children with anxiety, do a lot of family therapy, working with families, um, talking about how to encourage um, implementing coping strategies at home, how to, modif how to monitor uh, a child's anxiety level um, and, and strategies that parents can do. We'll also talk with the schools about strategies in the classroom that teachers can, can implement to help decrease um, a child's anxiety. Where where I start to, to question and possible refer for, to a psychiatrist for medication is due to the severity of the anxiety. Is, is our work being compromised by the child's anxiety is so high that they're not able to learn and access these strategies that we put in place during, during therapy? Um, is it debilitating? Are they not able to go to school to do any sort of um, previously enjoyed activities? Are they just staying in the house? Um, if it has that severe of an impact, then we consider referring for medication. Great questions coming in today. Catherine wants to know, how is a physical chemical imbalance in the brain diagnosed? So um, I, we should probably be very clear that it is not technically a chemical imbalance. So a lot of this is a misunderstanding. There was a lot of fallout from this recently within the last couple of months as a paper was published. Um, so just because we're modulating um, serotonin in your brain does not mean we're actually changing the chemical uh, nature and the chemical balance um, to a certain level. So we have measured and done studies that have basically looked at the level of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine in the brain, and those do not predict nor correlate with disease severity. So really what's going on with um, these is an adaptive response to a stressful environment and your brain is changing how it's processing that environment. What the medications do, and this is why they take so long to work, right? So if they, it was a chemical imbalance, we could probably recover that in a couple of days. But it takes weeks, and therapy is the same way. It takes weeks to maybe a month or more to really restructure how you're engaging with your environment, interpreting those signals that are coming in, and then basically manifesting the behaviors that are going out um, that are different than your anxiety or depressed states. And so um, it's not so much a chemical imbalance. I know that's kind of the unified Theory. People use that term a lot. They Somebody do. has a chemical imbalance, but and that's not necessarily that, No, the thing. So, so it's an easy explanation, but it's not the complete story. So um, again, like I said, there is not a chemical imbalance. I can't do a blood test or even like a CSF test to test your brain fluid and see if there's a, a difference in the level of serotonin or other neurotransmitters that will predict if you're going to be depressed or anxious. Really, it is that functional impairment, and then the medications act um, on the nerves, but that causes structural changes in the brain that allow you to better cope and adapt to your environment. Jean wants to know, do you have any suggestions about reducing anxiety without medication? I'd like to hear from all three of you. I you mean, start. as I already mentioned, um, changing your diet, um, exercising, getting good quality sleep, um, all of those things will go a long way to just reducing general anxiety and then just becoming more organized if you can. Um, that's really the, the biggest thing. Anxiety usually comes from those stressors when we feel like things are out of our control or we're overwhelmed. So yeah. trying to get organized, have a schedule, um, do all those things can be very helpful. Anything to add to that or anything specific that might apply to kids? Yeah, I think that just very similar to what you're describing is healthy eating, um, sleep, limiting screen time, um, and opening that space to, to have conversations about that. Labeling anxiety, you know, name it to tame it is what we say, is, is that you name that this is anxiety, this is how we're gonna address it as a family um, together. Name it to tame it, <laughs> I like that. Abraham, can you add any, um, any advice to this conversation about just ways to reduce our, our anxiety without medication? What have you found to be helpful in your journey? 
Yeah, so um, I like trying not to get on the medical aspect because, you know, that's not my expertise. Um, and and the, the reason why I even created the Freedom Project is to act as support for the experts. And the support could look like us just telling the story to make sure that the conversation is very clear and very concise. And, and I use experts like Dr. Tyler himself. Thank you for for being part of the Freedom Project, Doctor. Uh, and just letting them tell the actual story in a very, um, you know, like clear way so that people know what they're dealing with. And another way of support is, you know, I also try to work with state representatives to, to basically make sure that we are creating uh, legislation around education so that kids can start learning at a very young age. And the reason why I'm doing this is, is because as a kid, again, um, I didn't know that I was dealing with all of these mental illnesses. And I've always wished that I was, you know, educated properly so that I, I can tell the parents and be like, hey, this is going on. What can I do? And um, and I also want to make sure that, you know, psychologists also have resources when it comes to them practicing, because at the end of the day, they're also humans. They have to go home and deal with their own problems at the same time. But we sometimes forget that element. And I want to, um, you know, I'm, I'm like very focused on, on like licensing right now to, to figure out how we can make that completely like, you, you know, like universal so that costs can go down for day-to-day -day people that are trying to get access to uh, uh, mental health services. And also psychologists don't have to feel, you know, bad for just doing their job. Because I've had a lot of psychologists told me that they hate the fact that they have to charge X amount of dollars because they know that some of these people need their services and they're desperate for their services. But they, they also have to uh, pay, to, you know, their rent and livelihood. So again just support for the experts and i'm hoping with that support we can reduce you know just the crime around you know uh communities and make sure that we're having conversations as we try to figure out you know the the you know this very complicated problem i want to get to a couple more questions before we wrap up dr Draghi, my uh help help this listener out my daughter has anxiety that is both probably a genetic trait, but also she has a severe peanut allergy uh, that she's had her, yeah, that she's had her whole life. She has just gone back to school in person after two years of virtual school and her anxiety and mood swings seem to have returned. She did well virtually, but then they were concerned about keeping her so isolated socially. Is it okay to keep kids virtual if it helps with their anxiety? Um, symptoms, would you recommend that or what would your yeah, advice be? I, so my advice would be is I, I think in talking with uh, the therapist and in meeting with the therapist, you know, what we, what we, sometimes that can be avoidant um, and, and avoiding can, can have short term benefits, but it actually can create, uh, it can grow that anxiety. And so it can make it even more challenging than to, to jump back into the classroom setting. So working with a therapist and, and doing cognitive behavioral therapy, what we call exposure therapy and being able to start these small incremental um, strategies and, and approaches to addressing anxiety um, would be beneficial. Um, and so, so it really is not a one-size-fits-all recommendation. It really is dependent on the child, what they're working on in therapy. It's tough. Yeah, we want the magic mm -hmm. pill. We want the magic answer for all mm -hmm. of us. And it's tough. It is not easy. Yen Liang wants to know, this is probably applies to a lot of us, would the overuse of smartphones and computers lead to mental problems or for adults or children? Anything you could add there? I think that debate is still out. I definitely think some of the um, aspects of social media and high levels of phone use. Um, and the can, content. And the content can correlate exactly with anxiety and depression, but I don't think a blanket statement of, this is kind of goes back to the, the old adage of TV, whenever you let your kids watch TV. Clearly, if you're letting them watch 18 hours of TV, that's probably not great for them, but is two to three hours, I think the evidence on that is not clear at all. Um, and so I think this is one of those areas where we have to be comfortable as providers saying, I don't know how much is too much, but clearly if it's causing them significant distress for your individual child, um, you might consider modulating how much exposure they have to those things. All right. Anything, I mean, kids, I, I mean, parents are always hearing, I just went to our doctor last week and it was, that was one of the questions. How much phone time are you getting? How much screen time? So yeah. it's, it's again, finding that magic balance, right? Yeah. It's really challenging to, to, to find that balance. Um, you know, with the social media, there is, people are watching everyone else's highlight reel. And so there is that propensity for depression or anxiety or that, you know, fear of, of missing out. Um, and so continuing to monitor that as a parent um, and having these open conversations like we've discussed. Um, really will help you cue in to, to what the impact that that may have on your child. So you're saying not everybody's life they portray on Facebook is exactly what it is, right? Not everybody's <laughs> life is perfect. Uh, question, I, last question is, um, 
can ADD, ADHD occur together with an anxiety disorder? And does that make it harder to diagnose? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can definitely have both. Um, the, the thing that whenever you come in for a diagnostic eval, at least from the psychiatric side, what we're gonna try and parse out is are concentration symptoms um, that you're expressing due to the anxiety predominantly, um, or is there some other concentration you know, disorder that's there? And so anxiety can impair your concentration. So typically what we do is because our medications that we use to treat ADHD are very activating, so they can actually worsen anxiety, we'll try to get your anxiety under very good control first, whether that's through therapy um, or other medications before we would induce, uh, start a medication for ADHD. Um, but yes, they can co occur together, um, all kinds of mental health disorders can occur together um, with anxiety and um, yeah, makes makes the picture a little muddy, but we can figure it out. Sure. Well, and we, we just talked, this is such a great conversation because we talk and address mental health a lot, but not specifically anxiety the way we have today. So that's been really nice because I think we all probably have some or somewhere on that, on that curve. Um, I want to get to our final thoughts today. And Abraham, I'm going to start with you and I'm just going to um, start you off with Joellen's question. Where can I find out more about your project? And what else do you want us yeah, to know? So, yeah, so we're we're um, very like accessible uh, um, at this point because I've tried to make it accessible as much as possible. So uh, we're in Facebook as Freedom Project um, and uh, Instagram as well, uh, YouTube, pretty much everywhere at Freedom Project. And the shortest way that you can find us is FPFOR. Uh, sorry, that's wrong. We just changed that two days ago just to make it easier. But it's FP uh, Forum Casey. So you can find us basically anywhere. Any final thoughts you want to share with us before we go? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, so, um, you know, I want to piggyback on what you guys uh, talked about on the technological aspect uh, of, of like stigma, because as someone who is in the tech space, this is something that I hear all the time, which is, um, you, you know, this is going to affect kids. I'm just like, no. Um, you know, too much of anything can be bad. And right now I am seeing, especially on social media, Instagram, TikTok, I see a lot of people that are self-diagnosing and these people have millions of followers and, and that can be very dangerous very quickly. And uh, sometimes we would see comments of uh, kids, you know, 15 and under, just basically identifying with, with whatever this person is saying. Not that, you know, they're bad or anything. It's just that they don't know um even how to go about you, you, you know uh having this conversation around mental illness so to me i'm very um, focused on the conversation the education to make sure that we're not having someone with a, a two million follower just saying whatever and, and and then applying that to the uh to, to like the two million people that are following them because i believe that can be very dangerous so that's where the focus is making sure that you know we're not letting just um uh, basically, uh, people understanding what's the best way to have this conversation. I hope that makes sense. It sure does. The documentary is yeah. called Freedom Project. Abraham, thank you so much. We're looking forward to this documentary and this series, and we appreciate all the work you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Dr. Drady. <laughs> yes, let's go to you now. Yes. Final thoughts for us today. Um, my final thought is it, it's okay to not be okay. And so parents, talk with your kids, ask them, how you doing? Check in, how are, how are you feeling? Um, open that space and listen. Um, should you have concerns or things like that, seek out professional help. We're here, here to help and, and can make a difference. I, what did you say? Name it to tame it? Name it to tame it. I love that. Identify it and, and start getting help for it. Final thoughts, Doc? Yeah, so I think um, in mental health disorders in general, just know that we're here for you and we'll try and help you figure it out. Um, and uh, if we can offer any treatments, whether that's therapy or medications or whatever, um, we'll, we'll be here to discuss those options with you. Um, in regard to anxiety in general, I think, um, you know, if you're really struggling with that, um, please seek out care with psychology or psychiatry and we'll try and help you become a little bit more courageous um, instead of a little bit more anxious. Um, and so we may not be able to remove the anxiety, but hopefully we can change your response to it and make you a little braver in the face of it. Give you some tools, some good mm -hmm. coping tools. All right, thank you so much, all three of our guests. Dr. Hawkinson, wrap yeah. up our final thoughts today. You know, just thanking our guests and, and kind of echoing everything that we've heard. Uh, you know, anxiety is, is such an incredible uh, issue for a lot of people. Again, we heard about uh, the beginning of the pandemic creating anxiety, but also now creating anxiety as we are opening back up and getting to more normalcy as well. So I just encourage everybody, just as you're going to be doing vaccines and your testing, uh, your screenings, you know, really try to get that access to, to mental health and emotional health uh, assistance. 
uh, it will pay off and it is difficult as we've heard, but hopefully we're making that easier for people to get. Thank you for that. Finally, the sporting chiefs and Kansas City legend Len Dawson is giving back to the health system even after his passing. In lieu of flowers, his family is asking you to donate to the health system uh, in support of nursing scholarships. Here is some information right here on your screen. You can send that to Fund Development uh, there in, uh, in Westwood. Donations can be made online also at giving.kansashealthsystem.com or to Kansas City Hospice. His memorial service will be held on September 16th at the Country Club Christian Church in Kansas City. It's at 11 a.m. It is open to the public. Len Dawson died last Wednesday. He was 87 years old. Thank you so much for being with us today. Don't forget you can catch our shows anytime by logging onto Facebook, YouTube, and on Twitter. Coming up tomorrow, we look back at the evolution of COVID and the vaccine with the current director of Mayo Clinic's Vaccine Research Group, Dr. Gregory Poland. That's Tuesday on our Encore presentation, but we'll see you back here live Wednesday for Open Mics with Dr. Seitz at 8 a.m. The number of women in prison has increased by 475% since 1980. Coming up on the next Open Mics with Dr. Stites, we go behind bars to talk sexual health with incarcerated women. Find out why population health experts say the work is vital for these women, Wednesday at 8. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and Open Mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.